Do you have a favorite Christmas song? It's a real question. You, you, can, you can say it out loud. You can type it in the comments below. You can shout it out. What's your favorite Christmas song? Okay, you got some favorite Christmas songs. What, here's what I'm learning about myself. I've been thinking this week a lot about Christmas songs in light of our series called Beautifully Written. And I'm realizing, depending on the mood and the setting, changes what my favorite Christmas song is. So, so let me give you, for instance, when we're decorating our house, when uh, we were doing that a couple weeks ago, the songs that are on the top of my list are like rocking around the Christmas tree. I love Run, Run, Rudolph, but only the Chuck Berry version. Apparently there's a pop version, and it's terrible. And so, but I love the Chuck Berry version. But, but when it gets late in the evening, particularly as we get closer to Christmas Day, uh, late in the evening, I love Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. There's something about the tone and the voice that's just right for that evening, late in the evening. But, but of all the Christmas songs, my favorite, the one I always long for, I cannot wait until we get to the moment, is when uh, often when we gather late in the season or at Christmas Eve, someone stands up and sings, Oh, Holy Night. And there's something about that song that for me, it's so well written. The lyrics are so powerful. There's something that strikes a chord deep in my soul when that song gets sung. And yesterday morning, I was listening to it as I enter into the season in my own reading and writing at my home, uh, on my kitchen counter yesterday morning. And I was listening to the song, a version of it. And this, this line really jumped out to me. We're going to put it up on the screen. Thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Don't we, isn't there something about this time of year in this year that we get the idea of the thrill of hope and the weary world rejoicing? This morning as I pulled into the parking lot, it was still dark and I parked in my reserve spot at the very, very end of the parking lot. And I made my way into the building and I sat down at my desk, which is on just on the side of the building with a window where I could watch the sunrise over the airport here in Tupelo. It's the new and glorious morn broke. Beautifully written lyrics that are deeply longed for in our soul. My name is Will Rambo. I'm one of the pastors here at the Orchard in Tupelo. We're delighted that you're joining us, whether you're here in the room with us at Coley Road or you're joining us online, however and wherever you're joining us, we're honored that of all the things you could do on an absolutely gorgeous Sunday morning, that you've carved out time to be in worship with us. We are moving into a series called Beautifully Written, where over the next several weeks, we'll be looking at the songs that are written into the story that we know as the Christmas story. Today, we're going to be looking at a song of Mary, known as the Magnificat, in Luke chapter 1. So if you have your Bible or a device that you read from, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, third gospel. Uh, About 80% of the way through your Bible, you'll get to Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter 1, and we're going to read 39 through 55. through fifty-five. If you didn't bring a Bible with you um, and you're here at Tupelo, there are some Bibles on tables in the back. You're welcome to get up and go grab one. Page 613 connects to the Bible that you would get there. You can use it, leave it in a chair when you're done. But if you don't own a Bible that you can read and understand, we'd love for you to take this Bible as our free gift to you. When we believe the Bible is the Word of God, by reading it, we have a better idea of who He is, and in light of who He is, who we're called to be. And if this Bible would help you on this journey, we want you to take it. So we're going to be in Luke 1. We're going to read 39 through 55 and then talk about it together. Here's what Luke writes. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth, At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. Oh, how my, Mary responded, oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. 
His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. And God, we pray as we open it right now that you would speak into our lives, that you would remove any desire I have to, to be witty or to be humorous, and instead that you would give us your word, your insights, remove anything that I would say that gets in your way, that by having heard from you, we might be radically transformed, growing more and more into the image of your children. To you, our Father, in the name of Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Now, we want a little bit of context for the story that we're reading today. Mary, it says, goes to visit Elizabeth. Elizabeth and Zechariah, who we will actually talk a little bit more about next week. Uh, Elizabeth is pregnant. But she goes to visit Elizabeth because Mary has a visitation from an angel, Gabriel. A uh, quite familiar story in the Christmas story, immediately preceding the one that we're reading today. Uh, Mary is uh, visited by Gabriel who says, uh, you are with child, uh, you will uh, bear this child who will be the Prince of Peace, the Mighty One, the Son of God. And Mary is, does not receive this news as simple and just says, okay, she is overwhelmed. Now we hear it as good news because we know the result of all that will be. But for Mary, she sees herself as a teenager she sees herself uh, engaged. What would this mean to her marriage? How will Joseph respond? Will he worry about if she's been unfaithful to him? See, she, the angel says, you are highly favored, and Mary feels anything but favored. This is a disruption to the way that she expected life to be. She has plans. She had a path. She knew where life was going, and all of a sudden, Gabriel's interruption disrupts everything that she anticipated. But as Mary visits with Gabriel, what she sees is that it is a holy disruption. Now, have you ever been at where you thought life was exactly as you want it to be, and all of a sudden God began to stir the waters? It's a disruption, but when it's God, it's a holy disruption. She interacts with the angel. She has so many questions. How can this be? I've never been with a man. And she has this moment she must choose. When Gabriel says, it will be a work of God, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, Mary has to decide. Will she trust her faith over her feelings? Will she choose to believe that God will follow through on what he says he will do? And in that moment, this young teenage girl says yes to God's invitation. The angel goes on to tell her that her cousin Elizabeth, who had been barren, who was much older than Mary, that Elizabeth is now with child as well. So having received this news from Gabriel about herself and about Elizabeth, she goes, well, when I'm overwhelmed, the only thing to do is to go see family. So she packs up a few things, and she heads to see Elizabeth. Can you imagine that journey? Can you imagine the emotions? Can you imagine the questions that she had playing out all the scenarios in her mind when she finally arrives to see Elizabeth? And that's where we pick up. In verse 39, it says, when she, a few days later, as she gets there, she comes to Zechariah's house, she enters, and she sees Elizabeth, who is now very pregnant. For Mary has no outward indication of being pregnant. It's so early in, in her conception, Elizabeth is showing. And Elizabeth's child moves at the sound of Mary's voice. And they have this great exchange. And something about the exchange, maybe for Mary it's being so young and having so many questions. But when she sees Elizabeth... Elizabeth, who she knows has been unable to bear a child, and she sees the fulfillment of God's promise to Elizabeth. A little further down the line, something in that moment clicks for Mary, and she believes it will be so. She's so overwhelmed by God's grace. Notice the opening lines of her song. 
She's so overwhelmed with gratitude, she sings, and notice the opening lines. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. The response of gratitude is so often worship. Oh, how my soul praises, my spirit rejoices, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And if you have a pen or pencil or a phone that you can highlight, you might want to underline that line. Mary begins with recognizing that she is a nobody. By the world standards, she is a peasant female in a culture that did not honor females, in a culture that believed that she had no way to, to make her own way in the world. Not, not only is she a young peasant female, she is from Nazareth. Nazareth is the middle of nowhere. Nazareth is an insignificant city at that time in the northern part of Israel. It's not Jerusalem that she's from. It's not any of the influential cities of the Greco-Roman Empire. She's from Nazareth. She's from the country. And she's this young peasant girl. Opportunities were scarce for young women. Mary knows this and thinks, how could it be that someone from such an insignificant place who's such an insignificant person could be such a significant part of God's plan. And she's overwhelmed with that reality. Do you ever feel like Mary? Do you ever feel like you were unnoticed, that you're unknown, that you're unseen, that maybe God's not aware of what's unfolding in your reality. That's how Mary felt, but now she's overwhelmed with gratitude. She quickly shifts, and everything else Mary says is about the character and nature of God. She has been invited into a story that she is clearly not the main character of, and she wants to keep the attention focused where it belongs. So she sings praise. She gives thanks. Have you ever been stuck in the doldrums? Have you ever been in a low spot? Do you ever wrestle with ups and downs and find yourself needing to simply pause and recognize all that there is to be grateful for? Have you in the last, over this year, and the difficulties that it may have brought to you personally, for us locally and globally, have you at times needed just to pause and take an account of all that God has done that we might be thankful this practice breeds joy, and it breeds joy for Mary. And so Mary begins to think, and she begins to sing about all that God has done. Look at verse 50. It says, Our mighty one who is holy has done great things. He shows mercy from generation to generation. Imagine Mary singing, and as she puts her hands on her stomach, she knows that within her she is holding a child who is the fulfillment of every promise that Israel has ever held on to. Every story that her parents have told her by her bedside, every thought that she has had by candlelight as family sits around and, and talks about God's goodness together, every Sabbath, every festival where they talk about God's faithfulness, she knows she holds within her teenage body the fulfillment of every one of those promises. She's too young to be here, but there's so much to be grateful for. She thinks back over all the stories that she knows that God has been faithful to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David, that his word has been pronounced through the prophets, that over and over God has said there would one day be one who comes. That for all the difficulty that the nation of Israel and that the world had faced, there would one day be one who comes, a Messiah, a righteous ruler who would set all things back in order. And Mary sings with her hands on her stomach, knowing, believing, growing in confidence that she holds the one of whom she has always heard. All the stories that her family and her people have passed down Mary will bear the fulfillment of those promises. It is a powerful story. Stories have great power. My grandfather died in March. My, my pappy was one of my favorite storytellers. He loved to tell stories. Uh, I will, as long as I am preaching, I will always work him into a sermon. It's like a contract every six months. I got to work pappy in. 
Pappy told stories. He told great stories. And his favorite story was to talk about how he met and married my grandmother in six weeks. He loved to tell that story. He loved to talk about going on his first date with her and then having to get up the next morning and drive to Tupelo and break up with another girl. If that woman is here, I apologize. He was a good man, I promise. But of Pappy's stories, he had a storyteller he loved. I grew up riding in the car with my Pappy where he would slide the cassette tape of a guy named Jerry Clower. You familiar with Jerry Clower? If not, I'm going to show you a picture. You can go YouTube this afternoon and have yourself a blast. It'll be a great way to spend your afternoon. But I would listen to these stories, and I would watch my grandfather laugh and laugh and laugh at these stories. We love great stories. So think about Mary. Mary has heard all these incredible stories, the parting of the Red Sea, the promise of God, David's defeat of Goliath, the word over and over that one day one would rise up from the stump of Jesse and come set the people free. She's heard these stories and now they are being fulfilled. We love a great story, but Mary's getting to live in the midst of it. She goes on, God has shown that he will achieve his purposes regardless of what else is going on. When we fear about who's in control and what's going on in the world, we, Mary reminds us, she brings us back to this reality that God has removed leaders when he's wanted to remove leaders and he's raised up new leaders when he's desired. He removed Saul and he raised up David. He removed Nebuchadnezzar and he raised up Daniel. That God has used, however, and so now she is seeing that all the things she has heard, the revelations that have come before, now she's recognizing this is what they all meant. She's looking backwards at all the promises that she's heard about and all the stories, and it's like light bulbs going off. This is how the story goes. It's like when you and I watch a great movie, and all along you, you get some parts, but at the end they reveal something that changes, and you're like, oh, that's what was happening. Shawshank Redemption, Usual Suspects, The Sixth Sense, any of those kind of movies where there's some facet of the movie that you don't get until the very end. Hey, and if you've not seen those movies, between that and Jerry Clower, I've given you like two days worth of material to spend your time on. Where you don't know what's happening, but now Mary, Mary stands at the fulfillment of the story, looking back at the history of her people, recognizing this is what God has been up to from generation to generation. God is revealing himself to his people. All the brokenness and turmoil and strife of life is being redeemed. It will be redeemed, rescued and restored by the child within her. Overwhelmed by grace, she just keeps singing. She keeps singing to the God who is bringing to fulfillment all the promises he has made. Look at verse 55. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. All the way back in Genesis 12, the first book of the Bible, 12th chapter, God had made a promise to Abram and said, Abram, I will, I will bless you. I will make you great. I will make you famous. And your family will have a heritage and a lineage where you will be blessed so that you can be a blessing to the world. Since that initial promise, 42 generations have passed. 42 generations they've been waiting. I didn't say 42 years. Would you wait 42 years for a promise? I didn't say 42 months. We're still pushing it a little bit on our ability to wait, aren't we? I don't want to wait 42 minutes for a table. But they have waited for 42 generations. And God is now keeping his promise. Have you ever waited on God to move? Have you ever found yourself antsy? Have you ever found yourself saying, well, maybe God's not going to come through. God said he would do this, but instead this is happening in my life. Have you ever sat in the midst of things being incomplete and blamed God for what you thought was the complete story? Mary knows she bears within her 
the fulfillment of every person who had a doubt and a question and a disbelief. She knows that she's going to give birth and she'll hold in her hands one who will be the answer to every prayer. One that will be the fulfillment of every longing. One that will be the balm for every wound. And she says, God, you are a promise keeper. You keep your word. Do we believe today that God comes through even when it doesn't feel like it? Friends, it's so important for us to wrestle with because some of us today have been following after Jesus for a long time. And we know that to be true, but we, we confess in our weak moments, in moments when things are overwhelmed and stress is abounds everywhere, we ourselves can ask questions. How much more is it for our friends, our family, our neighbors who, who don't follow after Jesus? How much more they go, if there was a God, why isn't he? Fill in the blank. That's why Mary's song is so important for us. The promise of this seating, the expectation that we have for 19 more days, waiting to celebrate the, the one who comes. Is we, our world is in a season of waiting, just as Mary would wait months. We are waiting for one to come again who will restore, redeem, and fulfill every promise that he has made. And he is good on his word. The season approaching Christmas and our celebration of Christmas is a reminder that God has written a beautiful story and he's writing beautiful songs. Mary sings for us to bring us back to the truth that our God is faithful. We need Mary's song. Maybe more than any other Christmas that we've celebrated together, we need Mary's song this year. We need the God she sings of and that she sings to. We need this one who keeps a promise, who will restore all that's broken. You know, I told you I got here early this morning. I, I parked and I made my way in. And as I began to jot down some notes about this morning, I thought back to that moment yesterday listening to Oh Holy Night. And there's another line in that song that's really, really important. I'm going to put it up on the screen for you as well. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. I wonder how many of us, whether we're tuning in today or we're here in the room, I wonder how many of us need to enter into this season that we might be reminded of our collective worth that Mary would no longer be able to see herself as just a peasant girl from the middle of nowhere. She wasn't just an insignificant person from an insignificant town, but she had this significant part to play in the most beautiful song that's ever been written. I wonder how many of us this day need to feel that. The worth, the connection, that no matter what we bear with us and bring in today, there is one who has come and one who will come again. Mary, holding this little life inside her body, is so overwhelmed by God's grace that she sings, that God's grace would sing through her. So may we, we who are waiting we who are longing, we who desire to know that there is worth and there is connection, may we, may you and I this season be so overwhelmed by his grace that his goodness sings through our life as well. Let's pray together. God, I thank you. I thank you for your word and that you keep it. I thank you that in a world of insufficient promises, we can lean on you, we can trust you. If it feels like it's been 42 weeks or 42 months or 42 years that we have been waiting, Mary's song, the generations of waiting remind us that 
even in the midst of the dark, the light will come through. That you will fulfill all that you have said. And so God, I pray for us. I pray today if we tune in or come in and we feel weary and overwhelmed, I pray that you would visit us this day that we might be revitalized. And God, if maybe if we're tuning in or visiting today because we feel no worth, we're, we have nowhere else to turn and we find ourselves here before you, I pray that you would, you would speak into our lives and our hearts the truth of your grace. That the promise of the season The promise of the approach to Christmas and Christmas itself is that you step into our world. That you love us. Lord, make our life sing. To you, our Father, in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.